Psalm 127, 3. This would be an approved tattoo for my wife in the Lehman household. Supposing that tattoos were approved and supposing that she were wanting to get a tasteful one. All sorts of suppositions there. But the content, what I'm just trying to say is this. I love this passage of scripture. Psalm 127, 3. Behold, which means what? It means listen. Look here. That's, that's, that's the linguistic force of behold. It's to get your attention. Something important is about to be said. Behold, children are, uh, and think for a moment how our culture answers this. Children are a uh, expense. Children are a uh, possible nuisance. Children are a uh, life-altering, life-stage-changing. Now, we know what the scriptures teach, and I'm thankful for Nate's boldness in proclaiming that. But it's not what our culture says. I said to someone I love and care about recently, what would you think about a, another child? I was not talking to my wife or anyone that lives in my home. But I don't want to be so precise that you would know who I'm talking about. I said to this individual something about something to the effect of, huh, what it would be like to have another. And their response, their response, their response was one of, you would do that to your wife again? What do you want to do? Kill her? No, they didn't say that. They didn't say that. But that was the nature and tone. I promise you this. You go beyond two, and you'll start getting pushback. You'll start raising eyebrows. You'll start being whispered about at family gatherings when you're not present. If I had a dollar for every time someone said to me, I just can't imagine having another. Look at what the scriptures say. Behold, children are a, and you have to look at the entire phrase. They're not just a heritage. They're not just this gift, this blessing. I mean, if that's all that it said, that would be enough to shape our affections. But it says more. Children are a heritage from who? Yahweh. Yahweh, the Lord. Children are a blessing, a legacy from Yahweh. What a gift. And I want you to think for a minute. In our culture today, unless you have faced the challenge of infertility, and I don't want to assume that you don't ever face that, unless you've faced the challenge of fertility, in our culture today, Children are just assumed to be the natural consequence, the evolutionary result of sexual intimacy between a man and a woman. And that is contrary to Scripture. 
Scripture says that every conceived life is from who? Yahweh. This is in part why we don't support aborting a child conceived through rape or incest. Because even that child is an evidence of the sweet mercy of God turning evil into something good. Children are this heritage from the Lord. Look what it says next. The fruit of the womb. A reward. Well, one of the things we learn in Genesis 1 is that man was made in God's image, right? By man, I'm referring to humanity. Male and female, Adam and Eve, made in God's image. And theologians wrestle they meditate with, what does it be, me, mean to be made in God's image? And it's a wonderful journey to study. And yet, and yet, what does Genesis 1 teach? Genesis 1 first reveals that God is the creator. Creator of all things, but particularly the creator of men and women who bear his image. And then, what is the first command to man and woman? Be fruitful. In other words, image bearers, go image God. I want you to think for a minute, like it's good for us just bask in this. I want you to think we've got one, we've got a few, we've got a few single girls. We've got some real young ones that'll never remember this lecture. I want you to think for a moment. That God in his kindness gifts to a man and a woman the ability to come together and be a means of the creation of an eternal being. Why don't you think about that for a minute? An eternal being. Last night... I watched, before I went to sleep, on TV, how did they build that on the Smithsonian Channel? And they looked at several amazing architectural wonders. And they spent, for however long a normal episode of this show is, basking in the engineering marvels that these buildings were. And yet, those buildings, the best of them, will fade, will rust, will rot, will eventually fall. I suppose. One building that they looked at in this episode cost. This was a high-rise building in New York City where each individual apartment cost $75 million. It was a $1.2 billion construction project, 84 stories tall. It was an amazing feat what they've done. And to think that pales in comparison to a woman's ability to create in conjunction with a man. We don't want to leave the men out, but a woman's ability to create with the help of God, right? Because all of these children come from God. A woman's ability to create an eternal being. I want you to think about this. There's a lot of things that will fade, right? There's a lot of things that like once we enter into the new heaven and new earth, once we enter into heaven, there's a lot of things that are going to be far distant memories. Gardens, 
that we had here, cars that we drove, <laughs> maybe even jobs that we had. I probably won't be thinking much about my time spent at McDonald's, work in the back booth, or help an open in the morning, or the time that I spent at the Bass Pro Shop selling shoes and fishing type clothing. I probably won't remember the time that I spent as a telemarketer over in Daleville, struggling to make sales of Verizon wireless cell phone packages. There'll be all sorts of things that are just so distant from our memory unless someone provokes us, we won't give it another thought, right? But a child is eternal. And our prayer with the blessing of Yahweh is that our children that he would give us would come to know God, love God, and serve God. And what's in that for us? Well, the glory of God. The glory of God. Chief motivation. But what else is in it for us? I'm talking about eternal joy. Greg, you got how many kids so far? He's got six. Young pup. There's certain things that you just have to say when you reach uh, where, where we're at. You only get a few moments to actually feel, <laughs> you, you feel uh, uh, successful in some way. Okay. Um, I want you to think for a minute, like, eternal, eternally fellowshipping with men and women who bear the image of God and also your likeness. They bear the image of God and your likeness. I mean, that's amazing. The fruit of the womb is his reward, right? All right, keep, keep looking at it. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior. Don't judge me for this, possible Christian legalist. I recently watched with my boys one of the greatest movies of all time, The Gladiator. I didn't watch it with all of them. It's too violent for all of them. But I was watching it with my son, Gavin, and we were basking in the bravado of Maximus, Maximus, Maximus. Arrows to a warrior are meaningful. You run out of arrows and you are what? Dead. Dead. Running around to retrieve the arrows. Unless you're in the movies and there's an endless supply, right? Perhaps if we, will are, if we were all warriors, we would have a greater capacity to appreciate this metaphor. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior. The potential. I think, I think that's a little bit of what it's scratching at. The potential, the power. And I suppose we could say for, for good or bad, for good or bad, the potential, the power. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man. So I want to challenge you this morning. Do you feel that way? And I'm talking specifically to men. I'm not saying that it's not true that there are godly women who, for a variety of reasons, have come to a place where they're, they believe that in God's wisdom and guidance, he no longer would have them to have children. Like, I've got a box in my head for that, 
right? I'm not just going to presuppose that every woman, if given the opportunity, would have an untold number of children. I'm not going to presuppose that. I don't think that's true. I don't think that's an accurate description. I think we're giving too much credit to the natural state of a woman. Uh, giving birth is hard. Raising children's hard. There are many a woman that doesn't want any in our modern era. There are many a woman that just wants one, maybe two. But I want you to think about this, men. In my experience as a pastor, now for 13 years here, three years in a prior church as an assistant, in my experience, more often than not, the stories told to me are this. I would have loved to have had another but my husband. I entered into the marriage wanting three or four, but after two, he said. And my challenge to all men in this room, without trying to get too much into your business, my challenge is this, that we would be shaped by the scripture and the psalmist to see the blessed man is a man whose quiver is full. Now, if you're a smart aleck, you'd be like, well, I have a very small quiver. Don't say that too loud in the presence of other men. <laughs> right? That's, that's shameful talk. Right? That's like not, that's so not masculine. You say that around me, I will just look at you with pure and utter disgust. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. And, and someone, I can imagine, I can imagine my father sitting in this room. <laughs> I can imagine the conversation we have afterwards. And he's like, like, you just, son, you just take everything to its extreme. That's the conversation we'd be having. And there'd be a disclaimer. The disclaimer would go like this. The disclaimer would be like, you know, I'm all, I'm all thankful for children, right? I love every one of your, however many there are right now. Wouldn't, wouldn't trade them for the world. But I don't think you should have another. Son, your quiver's full. And it may be. How, how possibly proud for us to strike a posture like we can just produce children any time we want on a whim. Children are the heritage of the Lord. God, keep me from ever having that mindset that I, in my own strength, that I, in my own some capacity, can, can do this apart from God. Where does pride lead? To destruction, to a fall, right? God, keep us humble. But, but we need to preach this to ourselves. Blessed is the man whose quiver is filled with them. I've not met a man yet who doesn't want a bank account full of money, right? Right? Like, did anyone here, if you received any measure of economic stimulus uh, back when the government was just printing out money, if you received any measure of economic stimulus, was there a man in the room that sent that check back? Like, oh, no. Uh, President Biden, President Trump, like, I just got so much right now. My cup runneth over. No, we, we wouldn't do that with money, would we? And, and we tend to not do that towards the things that we treasure, right? My brother, if you were to meet him, he's only here occasionally. Pray with me that God would move him back. 
and that he would then attend this church. It would be so joyful to shepherd my brother. <laughs> it's probably why it will never happen, right? Um, my brother is a big board gamer, like Gen Con-esque. Like, I believe he's coming back sometime this summer to go to Gen Con. He's a big gamer, such a big gamer. He's actually produced his own board slash card game. I mean, he's, he's in it to win it. If you were to go to his house and you were to go to his basement where his home office is, you would see a lot of miniatures. Miniatures that you have to hand paint. Miniatures that are a part of these board type games. I mean, if you were to ask him, how much money have you spent in miniatures, he would probably blush and say, it's none of your business. And then if you were to go into kind of one of the storage rooms and you would see the shelves of just board games, there was a season of time, from my perspective, if the board game was produced, he owned it. What I'm saying is this, the things that we value, the things that we love, the things that we treasure, the things that we truly think are rewards and blessings, we, we typically, we typically have an insatiable appetite for. Like, I want more of that. Give me another. Now, do you suppose that the psalmist here is speaking from inexperience. Like he didn't understand anything about the time, energy, effort, physically, emotionally, financially, that are involved or that come with children. Do, do you think that he was naive? I'm going to give him more credit than that. I think he understands deeply all the good, bad, and the ugly he understands all of the muck that comes with having the ox called children. Remember what Solomon said? Where no oxen are, the crib is clean. Where no cattle are, you don't have to scoop out poop. But then he said this, but much strength comes through cattle. You can get a lot done with cattle. They're worth the expense. They're worth the dealing with the poo. If Solomon could say that concerning animals, how much more as he sits down and pins this, can he say this with reference to human beings? Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. Someone might push back and say this, Seth, are you trying to create a culture here in the church where there is an unhealthy pressure upon men and women to keep having children. And I, and I pray that my answer would be no. No. There is one word I didn't like with what you just said. There's only one word I bristle at. The word unhealthy. I'm all for creating a healthy pressure although I'm not thrilled with the word pressure. But I just want to be in alignment with the scriptures. I don't know how you can read Psalm 127 and not feel moved in your heart to see children as a good thing, to see children as being the favor of God, to see the idea of having a quiver full, whatever that might look like, three, four, five, six, whatever it might look like, to see that as something to be pursued unless providentially hindered. And there can be all sorts of providential hindrances. Health, age, 
fertility, so on and so forth. Blessed is the man. All right. I don't want you to think that I'm pushing too hard on this, but I want to be a little bit Puritan-esque. Let's, let's keep chewing on this. I want you to think for a minute, Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, that doesn't stand in the way of sinners, that doesn't sit in the seat of the scornful. His delight is in the law of the Lord. In his law he meditates day and night. Now think of the picture. Think of the word picture here. That man will be like a tree. What type of tree? Can you picture a tree? Can you picture a tree? What type of tree? A tree planted by the river of water. Oh, ooh. A tree well supplied with water. Okay. So not a sickly tree. Not a diseased, brittle tree. We're talking a well-watered tree. Ooh. He'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water who brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaves do not wither. Evergreen, evergreen, no withering of leaves. Brings forth his fruit in his season. It's a fruitful tree, productive tree, successful tree. Whatever he does, he prospers. That's the blessed man. That's the blessed man. The blessed man is a flourishing tree. If I was an artist, I would show you a picture. Here's a beautiful, luscious, fruitful tree. And then I would show you Charlie Brown Christmas tree. And I would say, which do you want to be, metaphorically speaking? And unless you're an idiot, you'd say, I want to be the flourishing tree. Flourishing is what we should mentally associate with the word blessed. So the man who has his quiver full of children, the man who's a warrior who's got many arrows, that man who's been given by Yahweh a great heritage, that man is the flourishing man. Now pause. You're going to pursue children, men? It comes with a cost. In my neighborhood, there are varying homes where they've got some amazing cars. Now, God might prosper some within the sound of my voice to where money will never be an obstacle, but because of certain life choices, joyful life choices, there's cars I'll never drive. My 2004 Tahoe that has not had air conditioning for like five years, that currently smells like grass, where the driver's side window does not function, that leaks oil, in my eyes is a beauty. Why? It's paid for. Why? It runs and gets me from point A to point B. And cars are not my treasure. My money has to go elsewhere. But it's joyful. Like, like you can have your cars. Because I believe there's really coming a day when I'm pushing around a walker and I'm standing in the city gate with some full-grown arrows behind me. Keep your Cadillac, man. Keep it. And keep your Florida vacation home. Keep it, because no one visits you there anyway. Keep it. I'd rather, I'd rather have children. 
The fruit of the womb is God's reward. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. Look at how it ends. And then this is kind of where I'm done today. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. He will not be put to shame. This is so masculine. Ladies, you're just going to have to indulge me for a minute. Like this, this is masculine. This is pure bravado. This is pure like step up to the plate. Let's fight. Let's see who's going to win. Right? Let's throw down. That, that's how I read it, at least. Like, we're at the gate. You're talking smack. No, you're not talking smack. And the reason you're not talking smack is because of who's standing around me. You're afraid of my grown children. They will not be put to shame when they stand and speak with his enemies in the gate. Who can you push around and pick on? Who can you push around and pick on? Do this by himself? Right? Who can't you mess with? Okay, do you remember the story of Jacob? Remember he had 12 sons? Do you remember when one of his daughters got messed with? And to Jacob's shame... He was afraid to do something. But do you remember the glory of the story that the sons did not share the same cowardice as Jacob? The sons took matters into their own hands and wiped out an entire clan with some real clever chicanery. Circumcise yourselves, and sure, you can marry our sister. The clan circumcised themselves, and while they're recovering, the boys come in and slaughter them all. My point is not to promote violence. My point is to say this. Who will not be ashamed when he stands with his enemies in the gate? Who will not be ashamed? Who? Okay, here's where I land the plane. How did Psalm 127 function in the corpus of Israel? How did it function? Psalms was part of the ancient what? Oh, you know this. It was part of the ancient hymn book. Okay. What is the purpose of songs? in the shaping of a culture. Why do, I mean, in bygone eras, why do we teach children songs like Jesus loves me, this I know? Why do we teach children patriotic songs like my country tis of thee? Oh, beautiful for spacious sky. Why do we do that? Because there is an educational shaping of the heart by way of song. So I'm thinking this, I probably haven't been strong enough in my exposition of Psalm 127. Someone might ask you, what did you learn about in the parenting class today? And I hope you won't say, man, Seth really wants us to have more kids. It's true. But what I hope you'll say is, I was reminded of God's view of children if nothing else, and let's say you have no more, because it's not possible for all of us. I pray that you would walk away however many arrows in your quiver that you'd recognize you have been favored and blessed of God. Treasure your children. Treasure them. Treasure them. See them to be the heritage that they are. See them to be the potential and power, the arrows that they are, see them to be 
the means by which you are blessed. See them for that, and then let, let our heart posture be every week to come over the next 13 weeks. Every week to come, well, man, if they're, if they're gods and they're this good, why don't we just determine to do this well? Right? If they're gods and they're good, then let's just commit ourselves to do this parenting thing to the best of our ability. Let's be all in. Let's, let's let the word of God correct us, challenge us. Let's let the word of God constrain us in such a way that we are seeing these children the way we should see them and we are stewarding their care the way the Father would want us to steward their care. Does that make sense? Okay. Let's pray.